Hi everyone. So this is just a very quick last minute run through for paper one. You've got your exam on Monday, Monday the 23rd of May. So you need to remember that there will be three sections in the paper. Section A will be the compulsory topics. So you have to answer all of the questions on changing climate and all of the questions on distinctive landscapes, those two sections. When it comes to section B, remember that you have to choose one of the three choices they give you. So you answer either hazards or ecosystems or resource reliance. Do not attempt to answer all three. If you have time at the end, when you think you've fully finished, you might be able to come back and have a go at a second one, but it's not worth wasting your time on it. And remember that you do have a section C. You haven't finished when you've done your choice of topic. You need to go on to section C, which will be the unseen fieldwork questions. And we know that that's going to be based on rivers. So the whole paper will be one hour. So it's a short exam and you will have 49 marks available to you. So some top tips then to remember during the paper. So we've talked about this many times. You need to remember that when you are doing the longer answer questions, you need to develop your points. So if it's a six or eight mark question, you need to link your points together. So maybe pause and have a little look at this example. But we need to be saying this happens, which means that this happens, which means this. So you're developing your points so you can get into the higher band marks. If the question asks you about a specific figure number, so study figure one and use that and your own knowledge or study figure one, describe this or explain that, you must make sure that you refer to the figure, maybe some um, specific times or specific dates or specific data from that figure maybe if it's a paragraph some specific figures that they've given you or some specific points you need to make sure that you are referring to that figure if the question asks you for a figure and your own knowledge make sure that you give both information from the figure and information from your own knowledge if the question is a describe command word, then you just say what you see. There will be no extra marks for explaining why it is like it is. Your marks will just be for saying what you see. If you're stuck with your longer answers or you're worried about how to structure them, then a good way to think about it is, OK, what are my social points? What are my economic points? What are my environmental points? And that might help you to add a bit of length and a bit of structure to a six or eight marker. When you get a question that asks you about describing the pattern or describing the distribution of something, if it's a four mark question, remember one of those marks is just for communicating your answer in a logical order. So we've talked about using the acronym GCSE, given a general comment, is the trend that it's increasing or is the trend that it's decreasing or fluctuating? Give some specific detail, give a specific figure for a specific year or the highest or lowest value. And then are there any exceptions? Are there any anomalies that you could point out? So are there any places where there are none of this certain thing? What are the places where there are the most of this certain thing? And just make sure that you write your answer in a logical order. OK, so the first compulsory topic is changing climate. So you have to answer these questions. So we need to be very clear on our terminology. We need to make sure that we're not getting confused between global warming and climate change. Climate change is throughout history where we've had warmer periods, interglacials and colder periods, glacials. And it's throughout history, warmer and colder. That's changing climate or climate change. Global warming is what's been happening recently. The increase in temperatures associated with the enhanced greenhouse effect and the enhanced greenhouse effect remember 
is where the sun's rays are coming down to the earth as short wave light waves bouncing off the earth's surface and turning into long wave heat waves and those heat waves are trapped by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere we've increased the amount of greenhouse gases through our cars through our power stations through burning fossil fuels methane from cows flatulence uh, paddy fields where we're growing rice and the more greenhouse gases we've produced the more heat is trapped and the warmer the climate has become you might get questions that ask you about natural causes of climate change Remember that cows are not natural. Humans have bred these cows. They're not there in natural numbers. So don't use cows for natural causes. You need to be talking about either uh, the variations in the Earth's orbit or the Milankovitch cycles, where we've gone from circular to elliptical over a 100,000 year cycle. And when we've got an elliptical orbit, we're further from the sun and the earth is colder. When we've got a circular orbit, we're closer to the sun and it's warmer. You could talk about sunspots. The more spots there are on the sun, those magnetic storms, the warmer the climate is. And we could say that during the Little Ice Age, there were very few sunspots, whereas during the medieval warm period, there were lots of sunspots. Or you could stick to volcanic eruptions. When we have a volcanic eruption, a huge amount of ash blocks the sun's rays and the climate gets cooler. Uh, you need to know evidence for past climate change. So you need to be able to talk about things like ice cores. So the ice cores is where we take that core of ice from the poles and there's a layer of ice for each year and we count them back and we study the oxygen isotopes, oxygen 16, oxygen 18 ratio. The more oxygen 16 there is, the colder the climate was at that time. It's very reliable because it's untouched by humans. So we've got this pristine model of what our past climate has been. However, it's extremely difficult to extract a core. So our sample of cores is very small, only one sample in many places, which is a disadvantage to this method and then you've got tree rings there's a different ring for each year of a tree's life if the tree is wide that means it was a warm year the tree grew a lot if the ring is narrow it was a cold year then you've got paintings and diaries where we've got paintings of the frost fairs on the river thames with elephants walking up and down we would never see that today. The river would never get cold enough for it to be frozen over that we could all walk on it. So this tells us the climate was very cold back then. However, paintings can be subjective. People use their imagination. But when you've got lots of sources all saying the same thing, that makes it more reliable. OK, and then you're case studies for climate change we need to be able to talk about worldwide impacts so we're going to be talking about things like sea level rise where the glaciers and the ice sheets are melting where we've got thermal expansion where the water molecules are expanding as they get warmer and the sea level is rising and this is going to impact particularly places like bangladesh a one meter rise in sea level and 15 percent of bangladesh will be underwater as well as that, the salt water will get into their fresh water supplies. They won't be able to water their crops. They won't have drinking water, which will impact upon their standard of living. More and more people in Bangladesh will be forced to move inland. This will cause overcrowding, which will make life very difficult and uncomfortable for those people. Tuvalu is another place, the island, where the highest point's only four and a half metres above sea level. New Zealand has said that they will take 75 of them every year as environmental refugees. And then we've got, you can talk about the more intense hurricanes because the waters are going to get warmer and that's going to impact people who live in hurricane prone areas like, for example, the Philippines, Florida. 
You've got the coffee berry borer beetle in Ethiopia that's destroying their coffee crops. And if they don't have their crops to sell, they don't make as much money. So their quality of life goes down. They can't send their kids to school. They can't get a good education. However, there are some positives. For example, northern countries like Greenland and in the north of places like Norway, Finland, Sweden, they will be able to grow more crops, more trees will be able to grow, which will take in carbon, which is a good thing for the environment. Then you need to know the impacts for the UK. So when we're talking about impacts for the UK, we could break this down into social, economic and environmental. We can talk about positive and negative impacts for the UK. So we can talk about things such as sea defences having to be bought, which will cost lots of money for the economy. Um, we can talk about having to re-tarmac our roads to withstand the hotter temperatures so they don't melt. The fact that there will be increased costs to the NHS of treating things like skin cancer and cataracts. Those are all negatives for our economy. However, we will see more tourists coming to the country because our climate will be nice and warm whereas places like Spain and Greece will be too hot for tourists. And if we've got more tourists coming into the country, they will be spending money in hotels, in restaurants, on ice creams, and all of that will boost our economy and be beneficial for us. We will also be able to grow crops that are worth more money. So for example, we'll be able to grow things like oranges, we'll be able to grow grapes, grapes, are not worth much in themselves, but they can be turned into wine, which is worth a huge amount more money. And again, that will bring money into our economy. Socially, people will face more water restrictions in the summers, like hose pipe bans, because we'll have water stress. People living at the coast may find that their houses are lost to the sea because sea levels will be rising, erosion will be increasing because there's more energy in the ocean. People who have asthma may find it gets worse. However, you could say socially there will be benefits. There'll be more of an outside culture with sports and music events. We won't have to spend as much heating our houses. Fewer people will die from the cold weather. So there are pros and cons in terms of socially as well. You also can talk about the environment. You can talk about the, the ptarmigan bird up in Scotland that currently is white to camouflage with the snow and ice. But as the snow and ice disappears, it will no longer be able to camouflage and will be very prone to being caught by its predators and maybe face extinction. You can talk about the fact that trees will grow further north into Scotland, which will be a good thing for the environment, which will improve the environment, will also be taking in CO2 for us. OK, so that's climate change. You can have a look at some of the questions, some of the specific questions on the next couple of slides. You can maybe pause the video and have a look at them. And these, remember, are the what's not come up yet questions. So in particular, focusing on, uh, we've got here how global temperature data can be used as evidence. So we've got records of temperature dating right back to 1880, but no further than that. We've got all of these weather stations across the world that are all collecting data, but some of them are a bit out of date. If we're trying to look at historic data, it's not going to be as good because technology is advanced. So there are lots of issues with this kind of data, particularly looking at trends over time. Uh, you've got a question about how reliable diaries and um, paintings are. We've talked about that already. We've talked about uh, volcanoes with their ash blocking the sun's rays, giving us a cooler climate. And then your other compulsory topic for paper one is distinctive landscapes. Now we know that they're going to focus on rivers for the fieldwork question. So we think possibly they will focus, be more of a focus on coasts in this section. 
So you need to know, first of all, your landscapes of the UK. So what do we mean by a landscape? We mean a suite of landforms, a number of different landforms, a large area. Landscapes can be built, made by people, or landscapes can be natural, where they've been untouched by humans. Remember, sometimes a landscape appears to be natural, but it's not. It's where humans have planted a hedge, planted trees, and they may not be the kind of trees that would grow there naturally. We need to know that uplands areas means hills and mountains, lowlands means flatlands. This word geomorphic we need to know. Remember geo means rocks, morphic means change. So these are processes that change the shape of the rocks. So erosion, weathering, mass movement. We need to be able to talk about the different types of uh, landscapes that we find in the UK. So we need to be able to say that the uplands are found in the north and the west of the UK, Scotland and Wales and northern England. So the Grampians, the Cambrians and the Pennines. Remember that the lowlands are found below that imaginary line from Flamborough Head to Bristol Channel into the southeast. For example, the Cotswolds or the South Downs. We need to be able to talk about how the geology of the UK varies. So up in the north of the UK, for example, the Isle of Skye, we've got igneous rocks like granite. These are hard, resistant rocks. They don't erode or weather easily or quickly at all. The soil on top of them is poor quality and waterlogged. Therefore, we have little vegetation, very little growth. Whereas in the south, the rocks tend to be sedimentary like chalk, which is soft and crumbly. So erosion and weathering happen much faster. The soil on top tends to be much better quality. So we get lots of vegetation and crops growing in the south. You also need to be able to talk about how the climate of the UK creates distinctive landscapes. So the uplands up in Scotland, in Wales, we've got high rainfall, we've got colder temperatures. So we get freeze thaw weathering taking place. We've also got more water from the rain going into the rivers. So we have more erosion, more rock falls, more landslips. In the south, it's warmer. So we have less freeze thaw weathering, but we have more chemical weathering like acid rain taking place. The different types of weathering, mechanical, chemical, biological, or physical, chemical, biological. Remember your three sciences. So physical or mechanical, it's the same thing, but just a different name for it, would be freeze thaw weathering. The rain gets into the crack overnight, it freezes and it expands, and then it melts and then it refreezes the following night, and that process breaks the rocks apart. Chemical weatherings like acid rain, which slowly dissolves rocks like limestone and chalk. Biological is where we're talking about plants and animals, tree roots, animal burrows, people trampling, that kind of thing. And then how do humans make landscape, landscapes distinctive? We build settlements, we build roads, we build farms. Remember that the UK traditionally or naturally would be covered in deciduous forest. We have chopped it down over time and we've built and put what our stamp on the, the landscape. If we were to all move out of the country, that forest would regrow. That's the natural landscape of the UK. Uh, what activities do we find up in the glaciated areas or the formerly glaciated areas? So remember the glaciers shaped the north of the country. The glaciers did not get down, the ice sheets did not get down as far as the south, but they did create features like um, U-shaped valleys and arets and pyramidal peaks up in the north of the country. And those very steep landscapes today are used for hill walking, for wind farms, for grazing sheep, for producing hydroelectric power in the steep, fast flowing rivers. OK, so we need to know that it's the rivers, the sea and former glaciers that have shaped our landscape in the UK. Different types of erosion. So remember, hydraulic action is the power of the water getting into the cracks. 
Abrasion is where the rocks are hurled against the cliff and they scour it away like sandpaper. Attrition, where two rocks crash into each other and break down into smaller pieces. And solution is the salts and acids that occur in the seawater naturally that dissolve the rocks. Transportation, the big boulders roll along the bottom by traction. Smaller pebbles bounce up and down, saltation. Even smaller, they get carried along in the flow, suspension. And the really tiny particles are dissolved, that's solution. Deposition happens when the water doesn't have enough energy to keep that sediment carried, and so it's dropped. So deposition happens in low energy places like bays and in the shelter of spits. Okay, so we need to be able to talk about the formation of these different types of landforms. So headlands and bays. So remember, headlands and bays form where there is a discordant coastline, where you've got alternate bands of hard and soft rock. And the soft rock erodes through the process of hydraulic action, abrasion, solution, much faster than the hard rock. That creates a bay. And the two bits of hard rock either side are left sticking out into the sea, creating headlands. An example would be Swanage Bay in Dorset. OK, so we need to be able to talk about headlands and bays. We also need to be able to talk about caves, arches, stacks and stumps. These are both landforms of erosion at the coast. So caves, arches, stacks and stumps form along a headland, along a hard rock headland. There is a crack which is a weakness. That weakness is exploited by the sea, by erosion, through hydraulic action, abrasion and solution. Eventually the crack widens until it becomes a cave. That erosion continues until it's eroded right through to form an arch. Weathering widens the arch until being unsupported, the top bit one day collapses down, which leaves a stack sticking out into the sea. The bottom of the stack is eroded until it falls over, which leaves a stump. And our example is old Harry and his wives in Dorset. Then we've got our landforms of deposition. So landforms of deposition include spits. So where there is a corner in the coastline, our longshore drift doesn't turn the corner. So do you remember what longshore drift is? Longshore drift is where your waves come in up the beach, the swash come up in the direction of the wind, so come up at an angle. The backwash takes the water back down, straight back down at right angles due to gravity. And then the next swash goes up at an angle, the backwash comes straight back down. And the sand is moved along the beach in that zigzag manner in a process called longshore drift. When the longshore drift gets to a corner, which could be caused by a river, as in this diagram here, the longshore drift does not turn the corner, but continues to deposit out to sea. It builds up above the level of the water and becomes solid land. The end of the spit gets hooked round by the secondary wind and waves. This creates a nice sheltered area inside of the spit where you get a salt marsh and a lagoon forming. You could talk about a beach as a landform of deposition, and you could say that during the summer, the swash is stronger than the backwash. So the swash pushes the sand up the beach, and the backwash doesn't have the strength to pull it back down again. And so that process builds up the sand on a beach. That's also a landform of deposition. You've got your river landforms here. We could just go over these quickly. So river landforms are separated into your upper course, your middle course and your lower course. So the upper course, we've got V-shaped valleys. This is where you've got a really steep gradient. So the river's flowing really fast. It's got a lot of energy. And so the river erodes down vertically to form a steep, narrow valley. Weathering acts on the sides over time to form the V-shaped valley. Then you've got the waterfall in the upper course. This is where you've got hard rock on top of soft rock. 
The soft rock erodes much faster than the hard rock through the processes of hydraulic action, abrasion, solution, leaving an overhang. That overhang is unsupported and eventually collapses down the bits of rock into the plunge pool, where the bits of rock become ammunition for further abrasion. And that process happens over and over again. The waterfall moves back upstream, forming a gorge. In the middle course, we've got our meanders. This is where, in the middle course, the river starts to have much greater volume of water and so starts to erode laterally or sideways rather than vertically. Water flows much faster on the outside bend. And so that this is where we've got extra energy and this is where the erosion happens. On the inside bend, the water is flowing much slower. It's much shallower. And so we get deposition. And over time, that river then moves. Eventually, you've got a really narrow neck to your meander. And during a time of flood, when there is extra energy in the river, the river takes the shortest course and cuts right through the neck, flowing straight on. Deposition cuts off that bend and we have a oxbow lake that has been formed that will eventually dry up completely. In the lower course, you've got your levees, you've got your floodplains. Every time the river floods, it deposits that layer of silt onto the valley, forming a flat floodplain either side of the river. The levees is where the coarse material is deposited close to the river, which raises the height of the riverbanks over time, forming those levees. OK, so then we've got our management. So we need to be able to talk about different types of coastal management that happen. So we've got our sea walls, which is where they build that concrete wall at the back of the beach to reflect the energy of the waves back out to sea and protect, therefore, the coastline against erosion. However, it's very expensive, it looks very unattractive, it needs constant maintenance because the seawall takes a pounding and it makes it difficult to get onto the beach. Then we've got our groins. Just have a quick look at how you spell that word groins. G-R-O-Y-N-E-S. Groins. These are our wooden structures that are built at right angles to the beach. And the idea of them is to trap the sand as it moves along the beach via longshore drift and build up the sand. And if you build up a nice big sandy beach, that is going to be able to absorb the energy of the waves and therefore stop erosion. However, it stops the sand getting down the coast. Down the coast, their beach gets smaller and smaller and therefore is less protected against erosion and erosion there increases. So it has a negative consequence down the, down the beach, down the coast. Beach nourishment is where we dredge the sand from the bottom of the ocean and pump it onto the beach. Again, we're trying to build up a nice big sandy beach to absorb the energy of the waves and stop erosion. Managed retreat is where you just accept that that coast is going to erode naturally and you just build, you move anybody back from the coast who might be in the way, whose property is going to be threatened. This only happens when it's very low value, where it's not going to cost much to compensate people to move them back from the coast. OK, so we need to look at our case study. So our coastline case study is the Dorset coastline. And then our rivers case study is the River Tees. So for the Dorset coastline, we need to be able to talk about the fact that it's a Jurassic coastline, 155 kilometres long. The geology is really important in shaping the Dorset coastline. You've got alternating bands of hard limestone and weak clay. So you get your differential erosion taking place. That resistant rock erodes much more slowly. And so um, it's left sticking out to see as the headlands, whereas the weaker clays erode much faster, forming bays. 
There are other factors that are also really important in shaping the coastline down here in Dorset. Remember, tectonics was important. 30 million years ago, when Africa and Europe collided, the rocks that had been built up in lovely horizontal layers became twisted and lifted and folded, and the youngest rocks ended up facing outwards. You can also talk about the stream that runs across at Lulworth Cove that was really important at creating a weak point, which could then be exploited by the erosional processes, hydraulic action, abrasion solution, to punch its way through that hard rock layer at the front and then enable the sea to erode the softer rock behind it really rapidly and create a cove. The climate is also really important. Over time, the climate has changed, and so the rock types that were laid down have been very different over time. You could mention the fact that in the Triassic period, it was a desert, so you had sandstone that were being put down at that time. Today, the climate's really warm with mild winters, but we've seen a really big increase in storms, and those storms have led to really rapid erosion and rock falls. Um, big, big damage, for example, to the Dawlish railway line that runs right next to the coast in recent years. And then humans have changed the shape of the Dorset coastline. We quarry for limestone, which we use for building, which makes the rocks much more vulnerable to chemical weathering. We've got a huge number of visitors coming to see places like Durdle Door and Swanage Bay. All of those people are trampling the footpaths and causing biological weathering to take place. And then we've also tried to manage the coastline. So, for example, a seawall runs along the town centre at Swanage to reflect the energy back out to sea. Groins have been built across Swanage Bay to trap the sand and build up the beach to absorb the energy from the waves. Beach nourishment has been used, dredging up the sand from Pool Harbour and pumping it onto the beach to absorb the energy of the waves and protect against erosion. So there are lots of factors that are important in shaping the Dorset coastline. One really important thing to remember is if it asks you about a coastline you have studied, do not talk about one specific landform. Do not talk about Swanage Bay or old Harry and his wives. That is not a landscape, that's not a coastline, it's not a coastal landscape, that is a coastal land form where you talk about one thing. So if it's asking about the landscape or a coastline, you need to talk about several different land forms. So you could talk about Swanage Bay and talk about old Harry and his wives, for example. So the River Tees is our river case study. So it's 137 kilometres long. The source of the river, the start, is in the Pennines. It's 893 metres above sea level where it starts and it flows all the way down to its mouth at the North Sea. Landforms in the upper course include V-shaped valleys where you've got the high energy flowing to erode downwards and then weathering creating the V-shape. High force waterfall is in the upper course. This is where you've got resistant windstone on top of softer sandstone and shale. The softer a rock has eroded much faster through hydraulic action, abrasion, solution, undercutting the windstone, leaving an overhang, which collapses down into the plunge pool and becomes ammunition for further abrasion. And that waterfall has moved upstream over time, creating a steep sided gorge. In the middle course, we've got our lateral erosion and we've got our meanders, such as those near Barnard Castle. Um, and in the lower course near Yarm, the meanders are really big and you've got several oxbow lakes that you can talk about. In terms of geology, in the upper course, it's the impermeable windstone that allows the river to form in the first place. So the water doesn't sink in and soak away through the ground, but sits on the surface. Geology is obviously really important at high force waterfall where you've got the soft rock underneath the hard rock. Climate is important. You've got such a high amount of rainfall, 1,500 millimetres a year, and that adds water to the river, which gives it energy to erode. 
Near the source, it's also really cold, so you've got lots of freeze thaw weathering taking place. And then human action along the River Tees. So you, in places you've got deforestation, which has taken away the interception of the trees and led to more surface runoff and a greater flood risk. But in other places you've got trees being planted to increase interception and slow down runoff and slow down flood risk. You've got cow green reservoir that you can mention that was built to store water and reduce flooding. You've got the fact that humans have cleared out the debris from the river to try to increase the capacity so that it can hold more water and decrease flood risk. You could also talk about the Tees Barrage, which they built to improve water quality and added that fantastic recreational area where they've got the big water sports complex. And they even put a fish ladder in so that the fish could navigate up and downstream. So you've got lots of questions that you can have a little look at, just have a look through. And then you've got the what's not come up. So to be able to talk about where the lowlands are, to be able to talk about the geology and the climate that we went through earlier. Uh, mass movements. Mass movements is where a large amount of material falls down at once, like a landslide. And these can happen where you've got a river or the sea at the bottom of the coast undercutting the bottom of the cliff, which then causes the material to fall down or slide down. Or it's a bit like uh, where you've got impermeable rock with permeable rock above it. The permeable layer gets saturated and heavy and slides down on top of the impermeable rock below. Uh, headlands and bays, formation of a beach, we've talked about. Um, spit we've talked about, waterfall and gorge, v-shaped valley we've talked about, meanders, oxbow lakes, floodplains and human activity along a coastal landscape. So we've talked about what they've done in Dorset. Geology, uh, if it asks for one landform along a coastline you could talk about headlands and bays and Swalage Bay or you could talk about old Harry and his caves, arches, stacks and stumps. Management of the river, we've talked about. OK, so then you will do section C, which is your chosen topic. So rather than doing all three on here, I've done a separate little um, PowerPoint with me talking for each of those options. So you need to find that now and listen to your chosen option. Then come back and I'm going to talk a little bit about section C here. So section C is where you will have your unseen fieldwork questions. So remember, you need to be able to do your four figure grid references. You draw an L in the bottom left hand corner of the square that you want to find. So if we're trying to find the information center on that first grid, we draw an L. The first part of the L goes down and it's 47. Second part of the L goes across and it's 33. So it's 4733. Three. Remember, it's always a long first and then up second. Six figure grid reference. We need to remember that each whole number is divided into 10 sections. So to find the parking as we're shown on there, we need to draw or in our minds imagine that there are 10 sections to that grid and we can see that it's 0, 3 and 8 sections along so 0, 3, 8 and then it's 6, 3 and it goes up about 3, 6, 3, 3. Remember you can be within one either side and still get the mark for that. Contour lines, when those brown lines with the numbers on them are close together that means it's steep. When they're far apart, that means it's flat. OK, so for the field work, we need to remember that we've got our process. We choose a question. We think about our methods. We go out and collect our data. We then present our data in appropriate graphs. Then we describe, we analyse our data 
we come to conclusions and then we evaluate. And they can ask you about any of those sections. So if we're asked, what would we study on a river? Here's a picture of a river, what could you study? There are several things that you could look at. So you could look at, does velocity or speed increase downstream? Does the width increase downstream? Does the size of the sediment increase downstream? Those could be your questions. Those could be your hypothesis. We talked about the impacts of flooding would be something that you could look at if you're going to study a river that floods. And you could ask people about their experiences of flooding and going forward what they think. So we said you could look at an economic impact of flooding for a particular area and look at how many buildings of certain value are within that area that could flood and look at how much it would cost. We could also look at social impacts and you could look at a map and you could identify the stations, the shops, the houses, the schools, religious buildings that would be impacted by a flood. You could ask people a questionnaire about flooding. How often do they think about flooding? How do they rate the likelihood of a flood? High risk, moderate risk, low risk? How, what, how do they rate the likelihood of damage to their own property from a flood? Highly, moderately or low risk? So you could talk about using a sample. You can't look at every single part of a river. So do you choose the beginning, the middle and the end, particularly if it's a small river? Do you use a section of the river and look at three points going downstream? In terms of hazards, what would you be thinking about? You'd be thinking about it being slippery and having sturdy footwear on. You'd be thinking about the temperature of the water. If you're gonna be standing in it, make sure you're wearing wellies. Is it going to be extremely hot when you're doing your field work? Do you need sun cream and water? There could be diseases in the water. You need to make sure any cuts have got plasters on them and maybe you're wearing gloves and you wash your hands before you eat. So these are all the kind of things you could put if they ask you about risk assessment. So this is the width of the channel will increase downstream. So what would we do? What's our methodology? We will stretch a tape measure across the channel at our different sites, moving downstream to see what the width of the river is at each site. Then we're going to put our data onto um, a scatter graph we've done here to see if the width does have a correlation with the distance downstream. Here we can see a positive correlation. The further we get downstream, the wider the river becomes. Or you could look at velocity. This is where you measure out a stretch, one metre or 10 metres along the river. Somebody puts a, a cork or an orange into the flow and another person times how long it takes that orange to travel that one metre or the 10 metres. You repeat that three times, take an average so you don't have anomalies, and that will give you the speed of the flow of the river at that point. You do that at three points down the river and you see if the water is getting faster as you go downstream. Depth of water, this is where you use a metre ruler to measure the width across the channel. It's three even points across the channel as you go downstream. Or you could look at the, the size of the pebbles, taking a random sample of 10 pebbles and measuring their long axis at each of your sites to see if they get smaller or bigger. It might ask you about what limitations. You might have uh, wind blowing. You might have people have put things in the river like um, trolleys and rubbish. You might have irregularities in the riverbed that can cause differences in the flow. Have you got people who are taking their measurements accurately? Does everybody in the group want to have a go at measuring? It would be better to just stick to one person doing all of the measuring to make it more accurate. And then if they ask you about evaluation or they ask or they give you somebody's data and ask you to evaluate it, 
have a look how valid were the techniques used did they repeat their tests more than once to look out for anomalies that kind of thing okay so that's the end of the compulsory sections for paper one make sure that you have also listened to your section for your chosen topic and good luck with your exam i look forward to hearing how it went afterwards